are in listen-only mode. Hello, um, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to part two of three of the Creating an Active Transportation Plan webinar series. My name is Paula Hyman, joining you again today from the Ohio LTAP Center. Um, just go ahead and locate the questions pod, same as yesterday. Type a quick hello, hi, make sure everything is working there for you. Um, our presenters are going to address your questions periodically throughout this presentation, and um, that is where you're going to put those questions. Um, attendance verification for all three days is going to be made, um, and uh, qualified attendees will be sent certificates after, um, along with uh, links to the recording of these sessions and all uh, PowerPoint presentations and documents. We will provide you with a link for that after all three sessions. I want to thank you in advance for your participation today. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass things off to Michael Blau, Senior Planner with Tool Design Group. Michael? All right, thanks a lot for the introduction, Paula. And uh, welcome everyone else to part two of the webinar series, Creating an Active Transportation Plan. My name is Michael Blau. I'm a senior planner at uh, Riding the Bike like Julie did yesterday. But I do have this uh, documentation of some pretty serious snow riding in Columbus from a couple years ago. Um, I've been working in tool design, the Tool Design Columbus office for a couple of years now, and I've been doing active transportation planning and programming all over Ohio for the past uh, almost eight years, and also working with the Active Transportation Academy during that time. So yesterday, just some detail about how to implementations, funding, and performance measures. Um, so for today, specifically, under recommendations, we'll be talking about um, facility types, how to develop a, a facility toolkit, um, talking about design users, as well as facility selection and guidance, and how to form all of those steps into a network rationale for your proposed active transportation system, uh, supportive programming. And then moving on to public engagement, we'll just go over some high level um, tips on you know, why it's important to involve the community, and then talk about relative costs and benefits of engagement strategies. Um, then we'll go into some specifics on public engagement during COVID-19, and we'll also be talking about equity considerations. Just going to briefly run through our webinar series goals. Um, goal one, possess practical knowledge of how to develop a jurisdiction-wide active transportation plan. Goal two, be able to identify potential goals for your community. Goal three, be familiar with how to determine existing conditions in your community related to active transportation. Goal four, understand how to identify the future transportation conditions that are expected for your community. Julie went over um, all of these items yesterday. Today we'll be covering goals five and six, beef transportation facilities, be familiar with how to utilize effective public engagement methods, and then tomorrow Catherine will be covering a plan. And yesterday that we are used for local communities to, is to incorporate some new planning tools and resources that ODOT has developed, make sure it aligns with best practices. And we're also developing an active transportation plan template that can be used um, by local communities to develop their own plans. And this webinar is um, already highlighting a lot of those um, best practices and, and resources. The detail you include is going to depend on a few different things. Um, first off, who's your audience? Are you um, targeting the general public? Are you trying to speak to other transportation practitioners or elected officials and decision makers? Or is it a mix of, of all of those groups? Um, you also need to think about your budget and your timeline and there are several other factors as well that um, determine you're engaged in. We'll talk about each one of these steps in more detail, but just want to let you all know that it's it's one approach. There are others. Um, this one has been applied successfully throughout Ohio for a number of different local active transportation plans. So starting off with uh, facility toolkit, um, built environment context and other factors that you see here um, that affect facility selection. These examples, um, these are all from Ohio, from left to right, we have the Grandview Heights bikeway plan. In the middle, we have the Scioto County active transportation plan. And on the right, we have um, the Lawrence County Bicycle and Pedestrian Plan. 
And Paula, could I just get a confirmation that my audio is coming through okay? Paula or one of the other panelists? Sorry, I'm here. Um, this is... okay. Go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. You can? Okay. It's, just wanted to make sure. Thank for you. Me. It's choppy for me. So I don't know if it's a bandwidth thing or what. Okay. Um, well, I will try to be clear and loud, and uh, hopefully that comes through okay for you all. Worst case scenario, you can join from your cell phone. Um, traffic facilities, which, uh, you know, in which all the users are sharing the same space. Um, these facilities don't offer a whole lot of protection for people biking and walking, and they're generally only appropriate on uh, slow speed and low volume roads. Next, we have visually separated um, between next to the travel lane. So these are typically marked with, you know, pavement markings. Um, typically, they're um, best used on, you know, low to moderately busy roads with, with low to medium speeds. Next, we have physically separated. These type facilities are still part of the roadway. Options like shared use paths, a, a distinct network for active transportation users. It's completely separate from the roadway. These facilities are, are generally much safer than the other two categories. And um, that's in large part in an effort to reduce serious um, injuries and fatalities among active transportation users and to provide them a more comfortable experience. And then lastly, we have intersection treatments. Um, designing for people walking and biking at the intersection is for transportation. So that's definitely the case in Ohio. Uh, in Ohio, we have 37% in the pie chart um, pedestrian crashes occurring at intersections. So these are pretty sobering numbers and they, they really speak to the need to design our intersections so that people walking and biking are not risking their lives every time they cross the street. And in the next few slides, I'll show you a couple examples of intersection design that improves bike ped safety. Um, I see a question coming in that says, who creates the toolkits? Do we create them? So um, toolkits are generally um, custom built for each plan, depending on what the community needs. If you are hiring a, a consultant or an outside group to help you with the plan, then that would on best practices and, and their um, expertise. Um, if it's a, an in-house process, then you would be relying on you know, local agency staff to determine um, what the most appropriate facility types and design options are for your community. And you might want to look at, at peer communities um, to see what they're doing as well. But there are a lot of examples out there, and there's a fair amount of you know, copying and borrowing um, between different examples of facility toolkits. So this table is going to show you examples from each of these four different facility types. And I apologize for all the animation you're about to go through. Um, it's color coded. So the mustard yellow color shows options that are only for bicyclists, like shared lanes, sign routes, shared lane markings, like boulevards or neighborhood greenways, and advisory bike lanes or shoulders. And the lighter yellow below shows options for both people walking and biking. Moving on, we have visually separated. So for bikes, we have standard and buffered bike lanes. We have shoulders. And then that lighter yellow shade is for pedestrian category, which is pictured on the bottom right there. Separated, um, we have. And then lastly, going back to intersection treatments, there are a number of intersections um, highly visible as they're entering the intersection. So this table is not exhaustive. There are a lot of other design options and, and various iterations. Many active, um, you will likely include uh, some of these facility types. And this selection covers, you know, urban and rural contexts as well as low cost and, and more. Um, and, uh, you know, a variety of, uh, of comfort levels is accommodated in this selection. Moving on to design users, comfort, and uh, we're going to focus on bicyclists, although they are not interested in biking, and they account for the rest of the population. Bike lanes, usually, um, they might bike on the sidewalk, even if bike lanes are present, and they definitely prefer off-street or separated facilities, or um, as an alternative, you know, low-stress, quiet residential streets. 
In the middle, we have the somewhat confident users. They generally prefer more separated facilities, but they are comfortable or they are willing to ride in bike lanes or on paved shoulders. And then at the far right, we have the highly confident. Um, these are people who are comfortable riding with traffic. They don't need bike facilities. There's a whole lot um, needed to, to accommodate that type of rider, although they make up a very small percentage of the population. If you look at the percentages down there, you see that interested but concerned individuals make up the majority of potential users. So networks that design for that type of user are more are supportive of more confident users as well. If we can design for the least confident user, then hopefully we can, we can accommodate everyone. Um, there are some exceptions to this. So the, the interested but concerned user is not always going to be the design user. Um, like in rural areas where you have you know long distances and difficult topography and terrain, um, that might make the highly confident user the more default because we're not expecting um, less confident people to be riding those roads. So like I said earlier, over the last 10 ages and all abilities, like who is the population that we are trying to serve or that who is going to be using this facility? Is there a school nearby? Is there a senior center nearby or another destination that could um, potentially attract vulnerable users to this, this facility? As you can see, the most separated facilities, the shared use paths and side paths and separated bike lanes, they can accommodate a much higher ratio of the population because they're catering to those interested and concerned users. So like I said, you know, we can't always afford to fit these. It doesn't always make sense in every type of scenario. And sometimes they aren't warranted. But generally, um, we, we try to steer towards these more separated and protected design options because they accommodate a wide range of users. So I forgot to mention earlier, we are using menti.com, again, 010752. And you should see a question popping up on that screen shortly. So the question is, who are your design users? Um, um, here we go. Elderly, pedestrian who are ages 8 to 80. And then box, you know, if there are specific populations um, that you're trying to design for, like children or low-income people, um, whatever the case may be in your community. I'm going to try to present this one. We've got uh, one or two more slideshow for now. And to facility selection. Talked about design users. We've been... Now we want to figure out how to use active facility. Um, nowadays, you can find it um, from many sources like FHWA guidance, um, such as this decision matrix from the FHWA bikeway selection process, uh, or sorry, bikeway selection guide, um, all the way down to local guidance, like this example of uh, crossing treatment guidelines from Wichita, Kansas. Both of these examples incorporate um, design user and community context considerations. There's a step in the bikeway selection guide to explore alternative bikeway types based on the design user. And the crossing treatment um, decision matrix asks whether there is a school nearby, which would indicate that children um, should probably be the design user. So you can you know, customize and adapt these types of tools to your own needs. You can also develop your own like Wichita did um, if you have the, the resources to do so. And before I... Uh, show you the next example of facilities and vehicle speeds directly in front of their, you know, in the center of their field of vision and, and braking and stopping distance in short stop. So for example, under 40 miles an hour, um, it takes 155 feet for a driver to come to a complete stop. And as a result of all of these factors, the likelihood of a pedestrian or bicycle, um, you know, fatal or severe injury rises dramatically risks and discomfort for people walking and biking. As motor, it becomes uh, much more difficult for people to share the road um, with, with bicyclists and pedestrians. These graphics capture the importance of motor vehicle speed and volume in facility selection. So to select an appropriate facility based on traffic volume and speed, a practitioner should collect baseline data on the roads in question and then take a look at these charts and both preferred and acceptable speed and volume values for each facility type. Um, you should default to the, you know, the preferred facility when possible. So let's say we're looking at a road that has a speed of 25 miles per hour and 
um, about 6,000 vehicles per day. So we're looking at a buffered bike lane as a preference and you know, ideally even bumping that up to a separated bike lane or a shared use path to provide um, more separation. Um, these graphics are available in the FHWA bikeway selection guide and also the forthcoming AASHTO bike guide update. Um, there are a lot of options out there for facility selection guidance. This is just a sampling. They cover all sorts of contexts, uh, urban and rural. There are federal, state, and local options to choose from. Formalize all of these steps into that planners and designers can reference when they're implementing the plan. But it, it should also frame the plan within a local context, talking about things like uh, how the proposed network was developed around important destinations, how the presence of certain populations like children or people with disabilities affected facility selection, and how the recommendations align with local priorities. So I've just copied some excerpts of network rationale examples from various plans around Ohio that I wanted to share with you. The uh, important text is bolded here. First one, the network is continuous, connects seamlessly across jurisdictional boundaries, and provides access to a variety of destinations. Recommendations use the city's existing compact, walkable, and bikeable environments to enhance active transportation accessibility and connectivity along low-stress routes. The proposed network prioritizes mobility for the county's underserved populations, including low-income workers, Black people, and immigrant communities. And lastly, recommendations connect local routes to the regional active transportation network, including the state and U.S. bike route system. Um, I'll, I'll spend a little more time on that last one. So Julie mentioned yesterday the state and U.S. bike route system. Um, just to summarize, it's a, a strategic statewide network. And it's, uh, it's an important planning consideration for local and regional agencies that are developing their own plans. You wanna make sure that you're tying into that larger um, statewide and national network as, as much as possible. There's a lot of data associated with the state and US bike route system. Um, you can take a look on TIMS and, and download the data from there. I'm going to show you, a, so recommendations of each project how they connect to other proposed projects and then what their priority is um, in terms of uh, prioritization factors, which Catherine will go into uh, into more detail tomorrow. Um, this is an example from a countywide plan. And for this one specifically, countywide recommendations focus on bicycle facilities. So that's what's pictured on the map. Um, Perry County is very rural and, and sparsely populated. So its toolkit focused on facilities that are um, accommodating highly confident users like signed routes and paved shoulders, um, as well as more comfortable and, and low stress shared use paths for priority routes. Comfort levels included there, as well as crossing improvements, which range from things like standard high visibility crosswalk upgrades to um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons and improvements at railroad. Um, this is an example from the Scioto County Active Transportation Plan, which has detailed recommendations for both bike and pedestrian facility. The biggest network rationale for this plan was the need for east-west connections between cities and communities in the county and also between neighborhoods. And there was also a big focus on connecting to schools. So Safe Routes to School played an important component in this plan. For complete street typologies has uh, some recommendations simply suggest a network layout without delving into facility types. This one again is from Dayton and they developed a, a proposed priority bikeway overlay um, which simply proposes a network based on street type. Um, it also incorporates Dayton's existing bike facilities, its planned projects, and its complete street typologies. So establishing safe and convenient active transportation infrastructure is um, infrastructure programs, um, which are typically developed, teaching people how to walk and bike safely, encouraging people to use active transportation through programming and incentives and awards, and engagement, engaging the public on what questions out there. 
there. Adept at incorporating genuine and effective uh, public engagement in our plans and projects in the transportation industry. And in recent years, we have started seeing a shift from um, simple public outreach, where we notify the public of what we have already decided is best for them, to more collaborative and empowering and engaging act or NEPA all have public involvement requirements, station planning and programming, and projects that may have a disparate impact on racial and ethnic minority groups and low income populations. Not all transportation plans necessarily have to comply with these regulations, but uh, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to cover your bases legally in case plan outcomes or decisions uh, might be challenged in court. You can find more information on um, these requirements in Appendix A of ODOT's Public Involvement Manual, pictured there. Consensus building, buy-in, and ownership. Planning and a vacuum, where we're just talking among ourselves as transportation professionals, typically leads to poor outcomes. We really need to constantly engage the community to understand the existing challenges and opportunities, and to make sure that our recommendations are actually meeting their needs and desires. As planners and engineers, I think we have a tendency to um, you know, think that we know best, but it's important to acknowledge that local knowledge and, um, and understanding is just as important as technical expertise. So we need to provide regular opportunities to participate in the planning process, which can help build momentum and ownership among the public. And lastly, local challenges need local solutions, not best practices. So engagement should help you contextualize your best practices so that they speak to the community's needs. In the active transportation business, we tend to idolize European solutions and use examples from European countries a lot. But there are um, a lot of other great examples all over the world. And there are probably great examples that are much closer to the communities we're working in that might be more relevant and more culturally appropriate. So for example, if I'm working in a Latino community, um, they might be more inspired by this two-way separated cycle track from Bogota, Colombia, than an example from Copenhagen. Or if I'm um, talking to people in Perry County about trails, I would show them this picture at, on the bottom, uh, which is an example from Marion County, very close to Perry County, has a similar built environment, similar demographics, and transportation network. So just remember that you can't fully build out your facility toolkit, which we talked about earlier, until you talk to the community and ask them what they want. And for example, if you learn during the engagement process that they don't want a state-of-the-art two-way separated bike lane, they'd rather instead focus on low-stress neighborhood routes for walking and biking that are clean and well-lit and comfortable, then you'll know what types of examples to show them later on. Um, this graph, um, starting from the bottom, looking at this audience and a more profound level of engagement. So delving into a little bit more detail into some of these examples, um, first off, pop-up uh, events or pop-up tabling. So the idea with pop-ups is that we don't want to, that way you can really reach a, a wide swath of the community, especially those who might not be um, able or willing to participate in online or traditional forms of engagement. We've used this to great effect in Ohio. We've held pop-up events for active transportation plans at all sorts of venues. Um, back to school bashes, pictured here, uh, county fairs, group bike ride events, grocery stores, block parties, street fairs. Um, so, you know, whatever the case is for you, whether it's a farmer's market or a church, a library, um, an annual parade, you know, whatever destination or event attracts a lot of community activity, that's where you want to be. That's where you want to target your public involvement. And that's where you can reach low income people, people of color, and other groups who are often overlooked during public engagement. Obviously, during um, the COVID-19 pandemic, these outreach strategies are less viable. But over the long run, I still think these are um, a, a really great solution. Happen like project goals, timeline, interactive tools like with travel environment and facility preferences. A wiki map pictured on the left is an interactive mapping tool that allows people to provide detailed geolocated information about specific issues on different routes, challenging intersections, and other you know important destinations. 
And that is a helpful tool, um, definitely during the phase of a plan. It's also helpful to replicate these activities in person where people can mark up a map with their comments and just make sure that the people without internet access can still participate. So again, in a time of, of street view photos, maps, and renderings to explore existing conditions, and that would use a, you know, a mobile app or a website or a phone number to guide participants through the city. Um, there could be multiple versions of the activity for people who use different modes of transportation, or it can encourage everyone to use a certain mode like transit or biking. Um, that would help cultivate empathy for people who have to rely on those modes regularly. So the setup sort of depends on, on what your goals are for that type of engagement. Should also say that you know nothing can replace an actual walk audit or a site visit where you really experience the challenges of navigating an auto-oriented street while you're walking or biking, and you encounter the noise and you know the other sensations that can really um, really make or break a travel experience. Uh, but these options um, during this time are, are definitely good alternatives. Um, I see a question about safe routes to school engagement, and I actually have a, a very apropos example for that. So I'm going to um, table that question for a minute, but we'll get to it shortly. So COVID deaths are public engagement before COVID and disproportionately impacted low-income people of color um, has left that's left in resources. So the pandemic, the pandemic really just further exposes that inequity that's already been there. And what is called the digital divide is now a lot more visible than it used to be. Um, Pueblo Planning, which is a, a consulting firm in California, put together this list of causes of the digital divide, um, which includes things like cost of internet service, access to electricity, lack of strong public Wi-Fi or limited uh, library access, and other issues as well that you can see. Um, Pueblo Planning also um, developed some solutions for uh, bridging that digital divide during COVID and beyond. And probably my most favorite example is creating hotspots using school buses. Um, installing, this basically involves installing Wi-Fi hotspots on school buses and leaving them parked in neighborhoods that have a concentrated number of pe people experiencing the digital divide. The Coachella Valley Unified School District in California has done this for the past few years. They equipped their buses with solar powered Wi-Fi routers and parked them in underserved neighborhoods to offer 24 seven online access, which I think is a really resourceful and, and brilliant way to, to use public resources. Installing Wi-Fi on transit, similar option um, to you know, benefit essential workers. Posting information and resources in essential locations like grocery stores, pharmacies, transit stops, uh, that's sort of an old fashioned, but um, tried and true approach, especially nowadays. Posting signs at affordable housing sites and other areas where you um, would expect to find vulnerable populations or people without internet access. Um, and, and there are other examples as well. So just trying to get the creative juices flowing a little bit and think about how we can um, bridge that gap uh, during COVID-19. So to be honest though, you know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And um, probably a lot of people don't care that much about the design of a separated bike lane or, you know, a crosswalk or whatever the case is, if it's gonna be built three years from now when their family members, their friends and neighbors are getting sick and dying from COVID-19 and uprising against violence and racism which has certainly touched a, a lot of communities throughout Ohio of historic. So people have a lot going on right now. They have a lot of resilience planted to one another and that they can cope. But I also want to acknowledge that will continue to exclude the low income and nuanced approach to this. And uh, so, and it directs people exposing them to any additional risk. Authorities are guiding the development of the
All right. So hopefully that answers that person's question about how to how to ethically engage um, students and and minors for act, for safe routes to school and writing prompts and other engage what what they care about in terms of the same what sorts of improvements they want to see. So just making sure that your materials are you know customized for children that they're visually engaging. Up up soon. I just have a few more engagement tips that I'd like to. Share. We need to acknowledge the community's expertise and ability to solve their own problems with our support, and we need to pay them accordingly. Uh, for one of our recent active transportation plans in Ohio, our local contact, the health department, had a budget for cash giveaways for people who stuck with us at community events, which was very effective at getting attention. Um, you know, you're all probably getting paid to attend this webinar or getting continuing education credits. So offering incentives to the public is the same thing. Engage community-based organizations as partners. Grassroots organizations can play a really important role because they are trusted entities and they are gatekeepers to these communities. So ensure that your community-based partners have the resources they need, um, whether it's promotional materials in different languages or spaces to hold meetings, whatever the case is. Collaborate and empower. Um, going back to that idea of moving from outreach to engagement, this graphic is from the International Association of Public Participation, and it shows the spectrum of influence the public can have over planning or decision-making processes. So you can see it identifies five levels of participation, inform, consult, involve, collaborate, and empower. And we strive for our planning processes to fall under those last two categories of meaningful and profound public engagement. But it takes a lot of effort. You have to think about your public engagement early and strategically and budget accordingly. A couple more closing thoughts, speaking to Keith Benjamin, who's the director of the Department of Traffic and Transportation for the city of Charleston. And she was explaining to him why she and her neighbors were not eager to be included in public engagement. This is a clear sign to me that we have, um, the way we've done public engagement historically and often continue to do today is ineffective and exclusionary. And it clearly calls for a more equitable approach so what if we committed all of our public engagement budgets to just listening to these marginalized communities, the most marginalized people um, that we're trying to engage, black women such as this person, trans people, people who are unhoused or people who have disabilities. It's a similar idea to accommodating all types of bicyclists by designing for the least confident user. If we can meet the transportation and mobility needs of the most vulnerable people in our communities, then probably everyone else's needs would be met too. This is an idea that um, Keith Benjamin was trying to convey when he quoted this woman. And to me, that approach makes more sense than how we've done things in the past. So it's just something to think about as you're forming your engagement approach. Got one more Mentimeter for you. Um, so if you could please go back to menti.com. It's actually a two-part question. Um, the first question is, who is well represented during public engagement in your community? 50102. Please navigate there and type in your response. We'll give a minute or so. Are there any questions in the meantime while we wait for these responses to come in? I'm not hearing any questions. So for adults, they're more of, our, of um, the last 15 or 20 minutes or so. And then there is one more who work two jobs or can't commute to meetings, people without the resources. Yep, so these are, um, and I, I do these with the great. On that, we talked about, um, specifically, she's gonna talk about responsibilities, performance measures, and then other tools and resources for you to use. I know we only have a minute or so left, so if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to, to drop them in the chat box. You can also contact me. My contact information is right here, and I would be happy to, to send you a response. Uh, no questions, we just gotta thank you um, in the chat box. All right, well, I'll stay on for another minute or so, but thanks everyone for, for joining. I hope you enjoyed it and appreciate your time. We'll see you tomorrow.